Hard Times by Charles Dickens. In this PowerPoint presentation, we shall critically analyze the chapters of this novel. So let's start discussing the first book, which is named Sewing by Dickens. And the very first chapter is titled as The One Thing Needful. When we read the first chapter of the book, we find that the personalities who are present in the room, they are uh, not given any name. They are not at all named in this opening chapter. And there is a reason behind it because the unknownness of the speaker when he's introduced, it allows his demand for facts to stand on its own because the, no the opening sentence of the novel is, now what I want is facts. Teach these boys and girls nothing but facts. Facts alone are wanted in life. Plant nothing else and root out everything else. You can only form the minds of reasoning animals upon facts. Nothing else will ever be of any service to them. So these words are being spoken by an individual who is not, uh, whose name is not disclosed in the very first chapter. And it immediately, the very opening paragraph of the novel puts emphasis on facts, that how much facts, uh, uh, you know, how much uh, facts appear to be wanted. Not only that, facts seems to be the only thing that is needed in life because according to the speaker's statement, nothing else in life would serve them any good. So one should only stuff their head with, uh, stuff their heads with facts and, they, and nothing should be planted in their mind. So reasoning animals, if someone wants to be grown as a reasoning, logical animal, what they only need is facts. So not only that, in this chapter, we find the word square is repeatedly uh, used and which describes, you know, how much Mr. Grant Grind is conventional in his philosophy of education and how much he is rigid, which means that he is not going to depart from his way of thinking so easily. And uh, the way the narrator uh, says here the, that he is reliant only on facts, which means that he does not believe in anything else. He does not rely on anything else, but he only relies on facts, which confines, which, uh, you know, which confines his thinking power, not only his own thinking power, but by stuffing facts into others' head, what he does is he also limits their power of thinking. So which appears, which says that Mr. Gradgrind, though the name is not disclosed in the first chapter, the schoolmaster, uh, he's, view on education is limited, restricted. And uh, as we read the novel, as we proceed, move, uh, like re as we read the novel and go through the chapters, we shall find that his philosophy of education would turn up to be completely fruitless. And now that he believes that this is the only education, that education of facts is the only thing that is needed in an individual's life would prove to be wrong because it would be proven later on that education of facts is not the only education that is that an individual needs in his or her life and that is why the chapter is titled as the one thing needful which means that according to the schoolmaster the he, the one thing which is needful or which is needed in an individual's life is nothing but facts As we move on to chapter two, the chapter two is titled as Murdering the Innocents. Now, why has Dickens titled it as Murdering the Innocents? There must be some reason behind it. So, it means that innocents, like young children, they are murdered. Their innocence is murdered because they are deprived, they are you know, deprived of imagination. They are not permitted to think. They are not permitted to imagine. Rather, the kind of education that is provided to them puts emphasis only on facts. So what we find in chapter two, that uh, Mr. Gradgrind, Thomas Gradgrind is introduced here. 
and he considers himself you know to be a purely uh, which depicted as a purely rational man who is only who only values facts in life and here cc jupe a young girl is introduced and we find that he addresses this girl as number 20 which immediately tells us that even a person's an individual's individuality is reduced to a number and that and that is why she is uh, addressed as girl number 20 and the educational process that is depicted in this chapter is also very impersonal and detached from humanity as well as injurious to the children why is it so because it only teaches them to learn facts and not to imagine not to give themselves to fancy anything so here this chapter is you know uh, uh significant because we find that cc cc jupe his name is actual name is cecilia but when mr grad grind interacts with her she is as i said she is identified as a number that is number 20 and she is also scolded you know for calling herself cc and uh, here uh, there is another student who is whose name is bizar and both of them both cc jupe and bizar they are asked to define horse now cc jupe imagines or you know describes a horse in an imaginative way using her imagination which is not which is found Uh, unacceptable by Mr. Gradgrind. While the definition which is given by Bitsa, it is given in a very formal way. So he, his definition of a horse is devoid of any fancy, is devoid of any imagination, and he defines it in a way that it appears to be completely. meaningless while cc jupe is portrayed as a girl who uses her imaginative faculty to describe a horse while bitsar what he says while defining a horse he simply you know uh, gives a number of facts about horse and he also speaks you know in a very impressive uh, vocabulary using bombastic words but the definition that he gives it does not offer any practical knowledge about horses and at the same time it shows that whatever he is conveying it lacks imagination so bitsar is a student so here a comparison is drawn between cc jupe and bitsar bitsar his definition is totally of our definition of a horse is totally based on facts while cc jupe's definition or description of a horse is completely based on imagination and uh, uh, we also see that uh, since mr gradgrind comes to know in this chapter that cc jupe's father uh, works for the circus so he tells her to describe him as a horse breaker so after this what we find that if we read that part where bitsa describes it uh, describes the horse see what he says quadra to graminivorous 40 teeth namely 24 grinders 4 eye right teeth and 12 incisive and so on so it is his description we can see that it is totally based on a number of facts and here in this chapter we also come across an unnamed government officer who also explains to the students that why a, a room you know should not be decorated with pictures of horses so the the speech that is delivered by the government officer by this unnamed government officer is also significant because he also eliminates any sign of fancy he also tries to teach children that fancy that, that fancy should have no place in their life because everything because it is unreal and uh, not only that uh, he also says like that you know there should not be flowers on carpets that flowers should not appear on carpets because they do not grow on flowers so the government officer speech as i said it aims to eliminate any sign of fancy or unreality from one surroundings which means children should grow up only by learning facts whatever they should do 
okay that should be entirely based on facts apart from that uh, so he according to the uh, government officer you know uh, that people are unable to distinguish between representations and reality representations like something which is represented suppose if you use your imagination and you represent it in your own way and reality is something different so it is so he says that since people you know do not have the uh, ability to distinguish between what is real and what is unreal so it is better to live a life where there would be no beauty no taste or decoration because when you want you know uh, to decorate something okay or when you want beauty in your life it costs you something so he does not want that and not only that we find that cc jup here is represented as i said as a stark contrast to bidsar because bidsar is someone who is who is who is educated into who is educated in facts and he completely relies on fancy and as far as cc jup is concerned she does not rely on facts why because she is brought up in you know a uh, in an environment where imagination is at work her father was a performer in circus and so she is used to imagining and therefore she had this first she had seen you know horses in circus so she had first hand knowledge about horses she had seen horses as well and that is why when she describes it she describes gives a definition instead of providing a definition based, based on facts she simply describes it using her imagination and uh, not only that so what we find in this chapter significant that the education that is imparted to the students in thomas gradgrind school is entirely based on facts and as a schoolmaster he discourages fancy he discourages imagination of any kind chapter 3 when we move on to chapter 3 there we find it is titled as a loop hole so when dickens titled it as a loop hole there must be some reason behind it as to why he titled this chapter as loop hole so here you know chapter 3 is significant because here we find that mr gradgrind as a school master strictly adheres to fact he doesn't pay any attention to fancy or imagination and it is in this chapter when he walks home from the school okay and he begins to you know think about his own a uh, responsibility or his own you know a role as a father as a parent he feels very confident because he feels that he is bringing up or he is rearing up his children in a proper way because they would grow up as members of society respectable members of society and they would be creatures of pure reason they would be you know completely their thinking their way of life everything would be entirely based on logic or reason uh, reason and while he was passing by the tents of the uh, you know visiting circus suddenly uh, he saw his own children louisa and tom that they were trying to peep into the tent to see the horse riding act that the horse riding act was in progress in progress and they were just peeping and immediately two of them were admonished very badly by mr gradgrind and louisa immediately admits that she is the one 
who actually asked or influenced Tom to come to the circus tent. So here when he, it is, this episode is significant in, uh, from this perspective that when Tom and Louisa are seen peeping into the tent, you know, it angers Mr. Gradgrind because he finds that his own children are, you know, uh, trying to, uh, let's say, trying to um, give, in, the, give themselves to uh, imagination. So, he does, he does not want his children, you know, to be affected by any such entertainment which is based on imagination. And therefore, he desires to protect his children from exposure to any entertainment or other activity which is based on imagination. But the way he, you know, uh, scolds them, it appears to be too exaggerated. It's too much. So what we see as children, Tom and Louisa, they are trying to, they behave, not trying, let's say that they behave like children. But Mr. Gradgrind here at this point prevents them to be children-like. He does not allow them to be their natural self. And here when uh, we find that Louisa, you know, when both of them are scolded by Mr. Gradgrind and Louisa tries to, you know, uh, defend Tom by saying that she is the one who influenced her to come here. So her comment is also, you know, dismissed by Gradgrind because we, as we uh, proceed through the novel, we shall see that Louisa, you know, is growing up as a girl who is unable to express her emotions, who is unable to express herself, her feelings. So whatever she says, it is immediately dismissed by Gradgrind because she is unable to give proper expression or she is unable to express properly what she was feeling. And this immediately shows how this education of facts has affected her emotionally. She is unable to express her feelings. So here from here we can see that Louisa as an individual is already affected emotionally by this education of facts. And uh, as far as this peeping into the tent is concerned, you know, Mr. Gradgrind feels that it would be too dis it would be you know too distracting for his children. Because and that is why uh, you know he objects to this kind of entertainment for according to him it has no practical application it would serve them no good and moreover it would cost them something so everything as you can see uh, from Mr. Gradgrind's behavior it is entirely based on logic it is entirely based on reason and Louisa, as far as Louisa Gradgrind is concerned, we find that she is, you know, uh, unable to express her emotions, which shows that her emotions are repressed. And it is this repression of her emotions which would, uh, you know, finally cause huge problems in her life. And that we shall see as we proceed through the uh, novel. Not only that, uh, that Tom and Louisa, they went to circus, that they were peeping into the tent. This action on their part also signifies that how much they are tired with their factual education because it does not provide them with any pleasure. It doesn't give them any fun. Their educa since their education, the education that is imparted to them by their father, Mr. Gradgrind, is completely based on facts and devoid of any fun, pleasure or entertainment. So, it shows their tiredness, that how much they are fed up with their edu with the kind of education that is imparted to them. In fact, this is very significant, you know, when Louisa, uh, you know, uh, she tells Grad Crime that she is tired of everything, but her whatever she says that it is that is immediately dismissed by her father. So why does he dismiss Louisa's comment? 
because Louisa is unable to express properly what she act, what she was actually feeling at that very moment, and that that is why whatever she says, it is ignored, it is dismissed by Mr. Bradkind, and then he becomes silent. And here we understand that from this instance, we understand that how you know uh, Louisa's emotions are Louisa's emotions get repressed. And whenever an individual suffers from this kind of, you know, repression of emotions, it actually causes much problems or creates huge problems in one's life. Chapter 4. So, when we move on to Chapter 4, so we find that a very important character Mr. Bounderby is introduced in this chapter and that is why that chapter itself is titled as Mr. Bounderby. Mr. Bounderby, we know that he is a local banker, he is a merchant, he is a manufacturer, he is a factory owner who always boasts or let's say brags about his current wealthy influential position in Coketown, this fictional industrial town, Coketown. And uh, Mr. Bounderby tells the, not once, but every time, whenever he meets the Brad Grant family, he tells them that he was born, how he was born in a ditch and what kind of, you know, ailment he was, he suffered and he also says that his mother abandoned him and he was taken care of by his uh, grandmother who kept him in an egg box and abused him. So you find that Mr. Bounderby, you know, he always keeps on talking about the stories of his own success, bravery and self-reliance. So he always projects himself as a self-made man, indicating that nobody has any contribution to his uh, present wealthy status that he enjoys at present in Coketown. And remember, all these stories, when he brags about his uh, stories of his success, you know, of, uh, his bravery and everything. He uses them falsely to bully others into admiring him. So whatever account is given by Mr. Bounderby about himself is not true. And so he uses these stories to make others admire him. And we also find how he describes, you know, his past life, that how he was a, like that, uh, that he went on as a, as a vagabond, okay, and he did several odd jobs. And how he himself, you know, uh, learned to read from shop signs. And he says that he is a very determined person, okay, and it is his determination that has finally landed him here. And we also find that in this chapter, uh, Bounderby is also, you know, Bounderby is also, you know, uh, shocked when he comes to know that Tom and Louisa were peeping into the circus tent. And along with him, Mrs. Gradgrind is also shocked. And both of them scold Tom and Louisa. Though it is found that Tom and Louisa, they protest that they just wanted a break from their lives of constant study. So again, it underlines, you know, their tiredness with their education. And later on, when all the matters get settled, so we find that Bounderby, you know, before leaving, he kisses Louisa on the cheek and then he leaves for his own home. And it is here, uh, I would like to point out that Suddenly, Bounderby begins to think that what attracted Tom and Louisa to the circus. And immediately it comes to his mind that there is a girl who also studies in Mr. Gradgrind's school. 
whose father is a performer in the circus. So he becomes very afraid about the you know uh, dangers that lie ahead if Tom and Louisa get influenced by this girl. So it is at his suggestion that Bounderby and Mr. Gradgrind they decide to turn Fifi Jupe out of the school. So this chap in this chapter we find that Bounderby you know represents all the worst, all the bad qualities that we can lend to factory owners. He depicts himself as a very so he's a you know not depicts rather let's say uh, he is a self-absorbed man, selfish, self-centered man who does not empathize with the workers of his factory, and he continuously projects himself as a self-made man, and he considers that the workers who work in his factory, you know, they do not deserve uh, any improvements for their working or uh, living condition. This is his, uh, you know. Uh, impression about the workers who work in his factory and when he you know before leaving when he kisses Louisa, Louisa expresses uh, her dislike towards Bounderby's uh, uh, behavior. She doesn't like it and uh, not only that uh, we find that after this you know uh, she dislikes this behavior on the part of Bounderby so much that she keeps on uh, you know, five minutes she keeps on rubbing the spot on her cheek with a handkerchief. So here we find that Bounderby seems to be interested, though uh, seems to be interested in Louisa, uh, in Louisa, and it uh, it also his action also portrays his affection for uh, Louisa, though Louisa's response has a different significance if we try to see it through a different lens of her final marriage to him because later on we shall find in the novel that Louisa will get married to Bounderby. So this particular action on the part of Bounderby, uh, as I said, it reflects his special affection for Louisa. Though at this point appears to be fatherly, as if his affection towards her is a fatherly affection, but later on we shall find in the novel that they will get married. And not only that, after they will get married, we shall see that his treatment towards uh, Louisa won't be that of a, you know, a husband-wife kind of a treatment. Rather, he would continue to treat her more like his child than his wife. So, here we... Another two, two, two more members of the family, Gradgrind family uh, members are, you know, introduced. One is Jane, who is Louisa's youngest sister, and Mrs. Gradgrind, who, like, she is a very, you know, uh, weak kind of a woman. And she also echoes whatever is said by her husband, Mr. Gradgrind. So, in Chapter 4, we find, we come across three, like, apart from Mr. Bounderby, Tom and Louisa, uh, they do attract the attention of the readers through their actions. Louisa appears to be someone who is completely, you know, ha is indifferent, who is devoid of feeling, while Tom is sulking and he feels very vengeful. Okay. And as we you know, uh, go through the, as the story progresses, we shall find that these responses, these emotional uh, responses from these characters become more and more significant. So, in chapter 4, we can find that Mr. Bounderby, his nature, what kind of a man he is, is completely portrayed and we also come to know about his attitude towards the workers of his factory. We also learn about his special affection for Louisa. And another important point that we understand from this chapter is that just like like, like Mr. Gradgrind, Mr. Bounderby is also opposed to imagination. He is also 
someone like Mr. Gradgrind who completely goes by logic or reason. Chapter 5 When we move on to Chapter 5 we find the key note. The chapter is titled as the key note. Key. The major point that we come across. Coketown is introduced. And here description, a very detailed description of Coketown is given. How it is, what it is made of, built of. Coketown is built of red brick, which is covered and it is completely streaked with black ash from the factory smoke stacks. And then we find the city canal, which is also running black. And this kind of description uh, indicates extreme polluted area. That Coketown is an extremely polluted place. And the river which runs there, it has also turned purple due to the textile dyes. There are 18 churches, but these churches are not well attended by the workers. And uh, we find that in this chapter, various societies and authorit authorities, you know, they are seen criticizing the workers for their uh, bad habits or vices because they are given to drinking, they are given to, you know, taking opium and everything else. So, apart from the, the portraying, depicting the grim environment of Coketown, the nature of its buildings, which reflect not only the uh, extreme pollution of the area, but which also reflect the oppression that is experienced by the working residents of Coketown, workers. So the dangers of this environment are also portrayed through the description of the extreme pollution because you can see that even the city's canal, the canal which runs through the city, it has turned black and even the Coketown, even Coketown which where there are these red bricks, even they have also covered with black ash because of the smoke that comes out of factory chimneys. So this gives us the, this immediately, you know, tells the readers uh, about the polluted area of Coketown. Then we find that uh, Mr. Gradgrind and Mr. Bounderby, now they have set out to find out that to look for that girl who attends Mr. Gradgrind's school, C.C. Ju. And there only, they suddenly, you know, uh, they meet C.C. Ju on the way because she was simply running through the street and they both of them simply admonish her, they scold her for her indecency and she was actually running away from Bidzar who was chasing her. And Bidzar mocks her for being a horse rider which shows Bidzar's, uh, you know, disregard or disrespect for this profession. So what they to do, uh, grad grind and boundary break, they send Bidzar away and they take ECC, who is actually taking medicine to her father and she was going back to the circus. So we shall discuss it later on, but let's talk about the workers as well. Here in this chapter, we find that just as in the uh, second, uh, in the first chapter, CC Jupe was addressed as girl number 20 in chapter 2, most probably. Here also, the workers, the individuality of the workers is reduced to hands. The workers are addressed as hands. So their individuality is disregarded, is ignored. So and it immediately shows the kind of treatment that they receive from the wealthier class as well as the middle classes. As far as the uh, you know wealthy class people or the middle class people are uh, concerned, they look down upon the poor. And they feel that, uh, you know, 
they have nothing to complain about their working conditions or living conditions because they feel it is their prevailing opinion that the worker that workers have you know access to the best food that they get the best food and resources while that is not the actual truth the truth is something else and the truth is just the opposite the workers do not have access to good food or resources in fact the conditions the working conditions or let's say the living conditions of the workers are so poor that it is not possible for normal human beings to survive properly it's completely unhygienic and dangerous for them but inaccurate assumptions are made about the living conditions of the workers as i said that these people feel that they have nothing to complain they do not these upper class people you know they do not feel that uh, the op- they do not feel that the uh, workers are dissatisfied with the working conditions with their living conditions and it is their on the basis of their own prejudice assumption that they have nurtured this misunderstanding that the workers are not at all dissatisfied appearances matter more to people like mr grad grind and mr bounderby and that makes them rebuke ccju for conforming to child wife behavior when they accidentally met ccju when she was running away from bizar they found her behavior to be very indecent while as readers we know that it is a child it is nothing but child like behavior and which is very natural on the part of a girl like sissy ju but they still scold her rebuke her for her indecent behavior that she was running in the street which they could not approve of which means that both mr bounderby and mr grad crime you know they cannot accept like they do not want children to behave like children because they find that such behavior is indecent such behavior is inappropriate and which again shows that for people like them appearance matters more to them appearance is of utmost importance extreme importance and when bizar mocked her for being a horse rider okay it shows his limited perspective because it is his a uh, disrespect or disregard for the profession that reflects his limited perspective because to bizar the profession of a horsemanship carries little status in the society and that's why he doesn't respect this profession at all so as far as this chapter is concerned we come to know a very important part of the novel of the story which is cook town and how in like what kind of in what kind of conditions workers worked in the factory and we also come to know the attitude of the factory owners or the or the wealthier class towards the workers how they nurture their own uh, misunderstanding on the basis of their assumption that everything is fine with the workers and they have nothing to complain and they are not at all dissatisfied next we move on to chapter 6 where the title we find is clearies horsemanship and in this chapter the members of the circus family are introduced and sissy jupe is also a member of the circus family because we know that sissy jupe's father is a performer in the circus and uh, if you look at the names of the members of the circus family these names have much significance 
Mr. E. W. B. Childers and Master Kidderminster. If you look at the name, see, every th these two names specially, they are associated with childhood. They are associated with, you know, it seems as if like childers, and child means child refers to a kid and kidder minister, kid also refers to a child. So their names contain, we find their names ha contain, you know, references to childhood, which associate them with innocence, goodness, and a childlike imagination. And that is why these names are significant. Even the name of the public house where the where at present, you know, uh, the, where the circus company is at present, the name of the public house, it also reflects two important features of the circus company. Pegasus Arms. Pegasus was a winged horse in Greek mythology and it is a creature. Pegasus is a creature. So it is a winged horse that is found in Greek mythology. And so we can say it is, we can see that it is a creature born of imagination and fancy. And therefore, it does not exist in reality because it is a product of imagination. And since it is a product of imagination, so naturally it, it does not exist in real life. And as far as Mr. Gradgrind and Mr. Boundary are concerned, we know that these two people are completely opposed to such things which are born of in imagination or which are products of imagination. Because they, they have this tendency to always disapprove of anything which has any relation to imagination. So, it is in this chapter we find that Mr. Bounderby and Mr. Gradgrind, they come to know from Mr. Sleary uh, or from the other people, the performers, like uh, especially like Kidderminster. Okay, from them, uh, it is found that CC has act is actually uh, looking for her father, but her father is not found in the circus. Because Sissy Juke is left behind by her father because for a long time Sissy uh, Juke's father has not been quite successful as a performer in the circus. So uh, out of you know despair or let's say out of uh, frustration he left Sissy Juke behind. Though as a father he loved her much he had much affection for his daughter because his recent performance have not been very good, went very badly, so he uh, left. And this is explained to Mr. Gradgrind and Bounder by, by Mr. Childers. Not only he also took away his uh, dog, Merry Legs, and so CC Jupe is now all alone. If you look at the character of uh, these circus members, the members of the circus family, Mr. Childers, you know, he defends Sissy Juke's father, saying that it is true that he left his only daughter behind. But it is true that he loved her immensely and he wanted her to receive education. He wanted her to educate herself. And so he left her so that she could have a better life. So he left her for her own good. And it is at that point that Mr. Gradgrind, we get to see here, you know, a different side of Mr. Gradgrind. He is a father. Mr. Bounderby is not a father. So as a father, uh, as a father figure here, Mr. Gradgrind, you know, proposes to adopt C.C. Jew. So he talks to the circus owner, Mr. Sleary, that as to what would be, you know, uh, best for C.C. And Mr. Gradgrind, as I said, he's a father figure. He, is, he also becomes, you know, much concerned to know that this little girl is left alone and now she has none to take care of her because her father is no longer there with her. 
and though although you know uh, mr sleary uh, tries to uh, assure mr gradgrind that they would take care of cc ju but mr gradgrind proposes to adopt her to take her into her home and to take care of her and he says that he would take cc jup into his home where she would be uh, you know taking care of his wife and she, he would also provide her education but he would provide her education only on the basis only on one uh, not basis sorry only on one condition that she would never think or speak of the circus again and cc jup's uh, love and respect for her father makes her uh, leave the circus and go with mr gradgrind because she knew that her father wanted her to be to go to school to be educated so she also consents to go with mr gradgrind and he says goodbye to the circus family here uh, this paradox uh, besides this paradox the circus performers intense dislike is also depicted towards mr bounderby because mr bounderby you know is a boastful man he always keeps on boasting about his uh, always about his you know uh, present status in the society so and that is why he is intensely disliked by the circus performers and they even go to the extent you know they say that it is maybe it is because of his attitude it is because of his nature that maybe his that is why even his own mother abandoned him so the paradox of familial love is depicted by mr sleary and the other circus performers we find that mr sleary and the other circus performers they are much attached to uh cc jup and they also feel bad when she leaves so we can see the difference in familial love there is a difference in the way everyone evaluates mr jup's act of leaving cc all alone as far as mr bounderby is concerned okay they look down upon the performers we know and the performers to look down upon mr bradgrind mr uh, sorry mr bounder by especially because as i said he is a very self absorbed man which they dislike apart from this we find that in this chapter when mr bounder by comes to know that uh, he consider comes to know that mr jup left cc alone left her all alone he if he doesn't uh, consider his act to be a very good one and uh, as far as mr gradgrind is concerned he is a fatherly figure so his way of evaluating this course of action by mr jup is a little uh, different it is likely that he also he too does not approve of this uh, action by mr jup but he also as since he himself is a father he understands that sometimes parents you know uh, do sacrifice for a child's interests and at the same time he admires mr jup's respect or high regard for uh, education and uh, this it is uh, here that we see a little difference you know between uh, mr bounderby and mr gradgrind since mr bounderby is not a father figure he is unable to understand or you know realize the importance the underlying significance like say or importance of the decision taken by mr jup which is on the other hand uh, understood by mr gradgrind next we move on to uh, chapter 7 which is titled as mrs sparsit so from the title of the chapter we can understand that mr Spars- mrs parsit is introduced in this chapter uh, she belongs to an upper class family and she narrates a man who also belongs to an uh, upper class 
family but he was 15 years younger than her and later on she became a after he, uh, she became a widow and after like after she also got you know a uh, separated uh, from her husband just after their honeymoon and it also you know her husband also had an early death just a few years uh, later and later on after that uh, she came to work for mr bondabai because she had problems with her relative uh, lady schedules and moreover she was left with no money by her husband so at present mrs parsit is a widow and she serves as mr bondabai's housekeeper and in this chapter we find that mr bondabai you know he, whenever he talks to people with regarding mrs parsit he keeps on reminding others that she uh, belongs to an upper class family that she has that her high origin because it makes him boast of having you know again here he takes this opportunity to boast that he has got a high born lady as his housekeeper and at the same time it it makes him you know represent or let's say makes him portray mrs parsit's social decline that from an high born lady that how much she has declined in her social status that now she serves as a housekeeper and this chapter 8 is titled as never wonder the title is significant because we know that mr gradgrind as a schoolmaster as well as a father never encourages fancy or imagination of any kind in this chapter we find tom and lisa are involved in a conversation with each other and in this conversation lisa tells her brother tom i wonder and this is overheard by mr gradgrind and he tells her lisa never wonder so it immediately underlines how much Mr. Gradgrind is opposed to wondering, because wondering means imagining or thinking. So when he tells Louisa not to wonder, it means it shows uh, rather how much he is opposed to imagination. Because he is a logical thinker, for him, wondering or imagining is something. useless and we also find mr gradgrind worrying over the fact that that workers in cook town are also given to imagination because they are used to reading novels from the public library instead of reading books or reading enough books about mathematics so here in this chapter we find that tom and luisa they have a long conversation with each other in which they express their dissatisfaction with their education because they do not find any pleasure it does not provide them with any fun or entertainment or any pleasure and at the same time we find that these two children are clueless they have no clue about their future about their life rather they are represented as you know aimless individuals do not not knowing what to do in their in the upcoming days in their life like uh, you know tom uh, it tells uh, luisa like how much he hates his life and not only he hates his life but you know he hates everything around or everyone around him but he only loves his sister luisa and he also expresses his disgust for his studies he says that he hates his studies and because uh, because it does not give him any pleasure and uh, tom you know from his from this conversation we also uh, get to see uh, a different aspect of tom tom decides to make up like for lost time like because now he is going to serve work for mr uh, bounder by and he wants to in cash uh, you know to fulfill his own vested interest okay he wants to uh, in cash mr bounder by's affection for her sister luisa in order to 
you know make his own way as far as lisa is concerned we also find that lisa uh, you know uh, she also you know uh, expresses uh, her sorrow uh, but she also you know uh, expresses her sorrow for her situation in life she is also seen to be unhappy she, she does not know you know how to make others uh, feel happy how to entertain others so she is portrayed as a girl you know who 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 doesn't know how to interact with other people socially she doesn't even know how to express her feelings which we had already seen in one of the previous chapters that she was unable to express uh, before her own father her own feelings so as far as these two children of mr gradgrind are concerned we find that they are like aimless individuals and this foreshadows their future that what kind of life they are going to have it indicates because storm has already started you know uh, to become a kind of uh, let's say self centered because now he is concerned about himself and that is why you know he counts on mr bounderby's affection because he knows that mr bounderby has a soft corner for lisa so he just wants to you know uh, make use of this of his weakness for his sister in order to fulfill his own vested interests so as far as wandering is concerned again if you look at the title of this chapter we find that uh, wandering things when we wonder means when we think it leads us to imagine something so it is something not at all based on facts and wandering means imagining therefore absence of facts it is only based on suppositions when you suppose something and that is why it is completely dismissed and discouraged by mr gradgrind and since tom and luisa's you know a uh, speculation when they start to speculate about their future that too is discouraged because it involves thinking or wondering because as far as ch- children are concerned we think we we always find children you know imagining themselves to become you know engineers doctors or teachers they always speculate about their future and it is necessary for children to speculate but this kind of speculation is completely discouraged by people like mr gradgrind because when children you know uh, they speculate it means they set goals for themselves they set an aim for themselves that this is what i want to become and with that aim in mind they proceed in their life and it is quite natural for children you know uh, to wonder whether they would become doctors or engineers or teachers in future but this is completely discouraged by this kind of thinking is completely discouraged by mr gradgrind and that is why as i said that they are seen and in, in fact in the upcoming chapters we shall find how tom and luisa gradgrind uh, you know uh, life become an unhappy one and how they emerge as adults having no aim in their life having no clear goals or desires which might lead to their betterment so as i said it foreshadows their futures and tom has already become self centered he is only concerned about enjoying his own life not only that we shall he would grow up as a self absorbed and immoral person you know where you know for his own enjoyment he would involve himself in some crime and he would pile up debts he would borrow money from people which would lead to piling up of debts and then he would also commit a crime to cover them 
so we can see that and in fact uh, we would see that mr gradgrind's education of facts is a failure because although as a father he wanted his children to become respectable members of the society to have a happy life but his education of facts failed to give them such a life such a good life they became tom would grow up as a self interest as a self let's say self centered self absorbed immoral person while louisa while louisa would remain passive alienated girl as before to whom whatever she does nothing matters so mr gradgrind's philosophy would fail to live up to his own expectations would fail to live you know up to its expectations which uh, he had in his mind because he felt he believed that the kind of education he provided to his children it would help them have you know it would help them have a very respectable position in the society productive members of the product product uh, productive uh, uh, members of a uh, uh, society but that is not going to happen and that would be very much evident in tom's actions as well as in lisa's unhappy life